Thanks a lot. Uh, we're called this half the park. It is after dark, and it's all about protecting and enjoying dark skies. I've got a presentation for you. So, introductions. I do a couple things. I brought all my badges, so you know, official. Yes, I do work at KBR as an instructor, so I've got a badge for that. And I'm also real happy to volunteer with NASA JPL in their program called Solar System Ambassadors. And then the final thing to do is I run a business called Driftless Stargazing, because those are my two favorite things, learning about our Driftless area and stargazing. And as I hope to explain to you, they go, they go together when I do presentations. Uh, feel free to take your phones out right now. You don't need to put those away. And if you're on Facebook, you could like my page. And if you like my page, I will let you know when amazing things are happening, uh, happening in the sky. So that's all. That's where we live. We've never really photographed it from that perspective before, but that's our home galaxy. And that resonates with me a lot every time I come to Kickapoo Valley Reserve. And I know a lot of you have a history with the reserve going back a lot further than my history with the reserve. But when I talk to people and get to know KBR, this idea of home keeps popping up again and again. Sometimes in the context of loss, that I know originally this was a place inhabited by the Hongshan Nation, who were <coughs> displaced during European colonization. And I've heard the very moving stories of what's happened to the settlers as a result of the dam project of how they in turn were displaced from their home. There's a lot of sadness to that story of being displaced from a home. But I'm also encouraged by the hope and knowing that the Ho-Chunk are back and helping to co-manage the reserve, the Kickapoo Reserve Management Board. And I've had the privilege of meeting some people who have lived here for a long time and their descendants and telling the story of this place. So it's always that mix of loss and, and hope. And where that ties in with astronomy is, I think it's good for us to know our home and to love our home and to have that connection with our home. And living here in the Driftless area, we get to look up a lot of nights and see our home galaxy. We get to see the Milky Way. And people in urban areas have been displaced from that, from that home. All right, quick review from fifth grade, because that's been a few years for, for some of us. But remember, the sun is a star in our solar system, surrounded by many planets and many other worlds. And our solar system is one star in our galaxy. And our galaxy, the Milky Way, is one of many galaxies in the universe or the cosmos. There won't be a quiz, but everybody okay on that? Okay, we're good. And so, three realms, sun's a star in the solar system, one of hundreds of billions of stars with planets, as we discovered in the Milky Way, and our Milky Way is one of hundreds of billions of galaxies in the cosmos. We're not used to thinking of, of that, but those are our homes. We live in the solar system, we live in the Milky Way, we live in the, in the cosmos. I was a stargazer long before I came to Kickapoo Valley Reserve, but working here has really shifted my perspective on stargazing and talking with other people here, working with other instructors and educators here. I think now more in terms of ecosystems. And when I look up at the night sky, I see it as part of this larger ecosystem that we, that we belong to that the cosmos makes galaxies. Galaxies make stars. Stars make elements like carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and potassium and calcium. And sometimes those elements come together and they make life. And sometimes that life achieves 
consciousness that becomes self-aware as we humans have done. So that's kind of our place in the in the cosmos and the bigger in the bigger ecosystem. Remember Carl Sagan? Yeah. Okay. He's a real hero. And the way he put it was some part of our being knows this is where we come from. We long to return and we can because the cosmos is also with us. We're made of star stuff. We're a way for the cosmos to know itself. Or if that's not working for you, remember Joni Mitchell? Mm -hmm. Woodstock? <coughs> we are stardust. We are golden. We are billion year old carbon. I was listening to those lyrics for years and then just listening more recently, just thought, yeah, Joni Mitchell. <laughs> she understood. We are billion year old. Carbon. So this idea of star stuff is not something nice that I'm telling you to make you feel good. Yeah, yeah, your star does. You are. We are. Our atoms were made in the stars, and now we look back at the stars and go, "Wow, we're a way for the cosmos to, you know, itself." And we have this long human history of interacting with the cosmos through art and literature and music, and that would be a whole other talk, but I just picked some representative samples by Vincent Van Gogh, his starry night there along the room. That's something everybody should have a chance to, to experience. Or right here in the United States with the amazing photographs of Ansel, Ansel Adams. And you can fill that out with all of your own, all of your own examples of the many ways that we interact with the with the night sky. It's kind of what we humans do. Marcy. I got this from the report on the visitor and I couldn't figure out who said it. So I put it in quotes and I wanted to attribute it. Was that you? The KBR is a 24 hour experience but most visitors only understand the daytime experience. I won't take credit for it. I want to give somebody credit for that. I can't remember. I'll look back. It was a long, long time ago. I think it was Marcy. We'll give her credit for it. <laughs> credit for that. And I love this artwork here by an artist called Tyler Nordgren. He wrote just a really, really beautiful book, Stars Above, Earth Below, all about our national parks. So for those of you touring mm -hmm. national parks, he's writing about stargazing there and then connecting it with the landscape below in the parks. And that's kind of where I part of my title for this talk, that half the park is after dark. And I know KBR is not a park, but I can't find a good ride for <laughs> the reserve. So I understand that. So, so we're working on that. But I like the retro 1930s WPA look of those posters that he puts, that he puts together for each park. And when I asked him for permission to use that in the publicity here, Tyler Norwood said, yeah, you can, use, you can use the poster. So you saw the results that Erica put, put together for, for this talk. I also learned that KBR is a destination for stargazers. People come here for many reasons, but one reason people come here is to enjoy the stars. This was a photograph taken here just last August 12th by a couple that came all the way up from Chicago because they wanted to see the Perseids. They wanted to see the Milky Way. And they drove three, four hours or more to come here just to, just to experience that and took an amazing picture there of our Big Dipper and, and Little Dipper up in the sky. A photograph from another visitor taken here at Kickapoo, at Kickapoo Valley Reserve. And just as we have received from the past, it's fitting and appropriate that we want to guarantee this. I don't want to go all Aldo Leopold on you, but yeah, this is something this is something we can give to the next to the next generation to make sure that they get to enjoy the dark skies that we've been privileged to, privileged to, to enjoy. So, yeah, I would put that in the category. That's a birthright to see our home, our home galaxy. So, what we're doing here at Kickapoo Valley Reserve, we have astro educators. I always like to point out that we got our hoodies extra big so we could wear them over <laughs> our winter, our winter. Coats, but there's Liz. 
Hey Luz. And there's Barb. There's Barb. And there's Susan. Hey Susan. And that's me. And Julie. Not here, but and we go around and we try to educate people and share the, the story skies with people. Yeah. KBR is a great place. People are willing to bundle up in the middle of January and go out on a hike at night. And you get a great turnout for things like that. I mean, this is the home of winter, a winter festival that people do want to you know, walk when the moon, walk when the moon is full. Uh, we're very grateful to the friends of KBR for donating a truly amazing telescope. And so we share that with people. And the whole idea is to get people to be awed by the nighttime, by the nighttime sky. That's an experience every young person should, every young person should have. Okay, that was a happy beginning, right? <laughs> Everyone feeling <laughs> awed? <laughs> okay. All right. The rhythm here goes happy, happy, happy. Then oh no, really sad. But there's a happy ending to to all of this, so I don't want to bum you out too much on a nice on a nice fall fall evening. Yeah. We're running this real interesting experiment on our planet by lighting things up. We humans are going through a real interesting time in this century. We are called upon to learn how to manage a planet. And there's just no one going back. I mean, there's seven, eight billion of us at this point, and we've changed this planet. We can't decide not to manage it. And it just seems like as a species, we're called upon to grow up in a hurry and to take on these adult responsibilities of learning how to manage a planet. And we have very little history of, of doing that. And interesting, challenging, kind of scary to see if we're going to be able to develop those skill sets in time okay, in, the next, in the next century. But that gives you a pretty clear idea of where people are lighting up the skies. I mean, here in the eastern United States, throughout, throughout Europe. Looking over here by Korea, you can see South Korea all lighted up. North Korea, very, very dark. <laughs> that's, that's, that's there. But yeah, that's the view of our, of our planet. Zoom in a little bit, and we've got the United States. United States there, and you can kind of see there along the underline of longitude, which is kind of a historical, historical divider. It took me a while to figure out, I mean, I recognize Chicago and Minneapolis and all the cities of the East Coast. What am I, North Dakota? <laughs> Yeah, mining going going on there. So and it's lighting up it's lighting up the nighttime sky at the rate of two percent. Two percent a year. Alright, coming into our home state of Wisconsin. You kind of see what's happening there. We've got lots of lights there around Milwaukee, and there's Madison and Fox Valley, and we got the Twin Cities up there. And we got that urban sky glow, but Check out the Driftless area. It's still kind of dark and worth, worth protecting. And there's a zoom in right there. They got it by a whole of it. They didn't label the Farge and they didn't label Ontario there, but we know, we know where they're at. But yeah, we've got some of the darkest skies, and there's that nice patch right there where there are some of the some of the darkest skies. Okay, there's the KBR, and we are at the risk of losing what we love. There's lights coming out from the Farge and from Ontario and Rockton. Not a real big place, but it's it's putting out some it's putting out some lights putting out some lights lights there. And you can play around these maps and zoom in on one. It was so detailed, I could see the parking lot. Okay, not, it's great lighting there, but I could see that there's lights there where there aren't lights in the other, in the other areas. So, people are watching us from up in, from up in space of knowing where the, where the lights are. So this is a very valuable tool. But the sad thing is, yeah, we love the night sky and we are, 
we are losing it. And as I said, we're running this real interesting experiment on, on human health, and I keep reading more and more research of how light is affecting our health, health, how it's messing up our circadian, circadian rhythms. I mean, it's things such as our smartphones. You notice there's blue filters on there? Have you noticed that? And they talk especially about that blue light, or one ring light, why can't I fall asleep at night? Well, I'm staring at my phone and getting that blue light, which is telling my brain, it's morning, wake up, and gearing up for, gearing up for that. And that's sort of, I mean, we love our phones, but that's kind of an unintended, unintended consequence of the color of light, the intensity of light that we look at, we're not adapted for, for that. And it's just starting to be studied about the risk of different diseases, disorders, of cancer that comes as a result of this exposure to, to light. And, you know, we've been kind of reckless of lighting up our world and then thinking that, oh, is this good? Is this healthy for us to be, to be doing? All right, uh, you said, what was it, Ben said animals are good? Okay, people like animals, okay. And reading more and more how this artificial light is disrupting animals as well, <coughs> with toads and salmon and bird migration and nocturnal pollinators and fireflies are all being disrupted. So, as I said, it's this unplanned experiment that we are running with very, very dangerous consequences. If you thought I was coming here tonight to say, we must save the stars. Yeah, that's important to me, but to be real honest with you, the stars are going to be just fine. <laughs> They're just going to go on without us. What I'm more worried about are the humans and the other living things in our, in our ecosystem when we start lighting up our world at night. Because we know it disrupts our sleep, it's destroying health, degrading the environment, confusing migrators, interrupting pollinators, we're getting cut off from this heritage of the nighttime sky. It's wasting an awful lot of energy and money, and it's making us less safe at night as well, which seems counterintuitive because we've been taught right equals safe, but not necessarily. So, all right, hopeful part. Everybody remember the watch, right? Okay, there it is. Hope of people can make things better. Also, to flash forward, the solutions are relatively simple because I am aware that it's September 2018 in the United States of America and maybe everyone's feeling kind of overwhelmed with the number of problems that need our attention. We need to take care of one another and not burn out trying to solve problems. These solutions are relatively simple and relatively inexpensive, so there's hope. There's hope because there's places like Kickapoo Valley Reserve. I should have reviewed the mission statement, but it seems to be KPR protects stuff. And I'm just running through my mind of just, yeah, trees, bats, frogs, plants, birds, petroglyphs. Marcy, what else is protected? 8,600 acres. Okay, 8,600 acres. This is the mission of, of the reserve. And if we need kind of a guardian angel or patron saint for this, the International Dark Sky Association has come up with Orion the Protector, the traditional constellation of Orion the Hunter, but instead make Orion into a protector, and her job is to you know, represent the ongoing fight to protect our dark skies from light pollution. So let's take a little bit of inspiration from Orion the Protector of the nighttime, of the nighttime sky. All right, not to get too personal, but show of hands, who turns off their lights when they go to bed at night? Yeah, that's what I thought. That's what we do because we want it dark. You get it. We like it dark yeah. at, at night. Okay, number 147 of things I love about Kickapoo Valley Reserve, that when I'm here, I can borrow a key and go to the panel boxes and open it up and trip the circuit breakers to turn off the lights. And I smile every time I get there. I don't know if Jason did or if Ben did, but somebody labeled the circuits stargazing right there in the panel box. So I'm thinking, okay, KBR is a cool place. We can turn off the lights and look at the stars. And they've labeled which, which circuits we want to, 
want to do. All right, talk a little bit about our relationship with nighttime. And it is a human thing there that we humans, you know, for most of our existence, we had this connection with the night. We had the full moon when it was bright, and new moon when it was dark. And just in the last couple of centuries, we've been changing the rules of the game by lighting up the night. And it started slowly, maybe just three centuries ago. It started out with oil lamps or wooden poles, and then cast iron fixtures, gas lamps, electric lamps, and then all of a sudden it just got brighter and brighter. That scene that Van Gogh painted, yeah, people have gone back there to look for those stars. They're not visible there anymore. And that's just in a, in a century and a half. And the outdoor lighting has a big long list. Street lighting, roadway, parks, stadiums, parking lot, landscape, residential buildings, pedestrian, bicycle paths. We're just lighting everything, everything up. And I think the solution is to develop a certain mindfulness about outdoor lighting. I'm not here tonight saying, let's turn off all the lights at night so that I can stargaze. Mm -hmm. Nighttime lighting has a purpose, but it's a question of staying mindful about that. We do want to be safe and secure at night, and lighting can help us to do that. We're more likely to use parks and walkways at night with good lighting get us out into the night. I work a little bit at American Players Theater, and I go to nighttime performances there, and I look, oh, look at you guys, you're shining all those lights up into the trees to create staging right here. But then I'm thinking, well, that's kind of cool, and that's a good backdrop. So that's a mindful use of lighting. Plus, when they're done with the play, they turn the lights, they turn the lights off. And, you know, fountains like that are kind of cool. And I do like lights on the roads when I'm trying to drive and navigate at, at night. So don't leave here thinking we got to turn off all the lights. It's being mindful about our use of lights. But there is this form called light pollution. And maybe it's like those conversations we have when we're gardening or working on a prairie. Okay, is that native or invasive? Is that a good plant or bad plant? And you know, there's that definition of weed, which is just a plant that's out of place a little bit. So light pollution is just light that is out of place. It performs no function. It's sky glow, lighting up the sky. It's glare, light that's shining in our, that's shining in our faces. It's light going where it's not supposed to go, like into our neighbor's windows and lighting up their, lighting up their homes. Okay, it's this misplaced light. That's pretty good outdoor lighting, right? One of the guys, person wants to be able to see their door. It's lighting up. It's lighting up their doorway. Okay, that's 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 good. Some shoulds, yeah. Enhance visibility, not produce glare, be part of the landscape, avoid light trespass, and kind of master plan when the light comes, light comes together. And we want to be safe and secure. We want good food, sight, light, nighttime baseball. And it's kind of good to be able to light up a baseball, light up a baseball field so that we can kind of extend into the, into the nighttime. The key is shielding our lights. Most places we go to, we're used to this type of lighting, which is putting light out into, well, not all directions, but a lot of directions where it shouldn't go, versus shielded lighting, which is putting light right down. Once you start knowing about this, you see it everywhere. This is not good lighting. Yes, I want the volunteer firefighters to be able to see where they're, where they're going in and out of the, of the firehouse. But these lights are shining at us. And I would say it's making it more dangerous with that glare. Here the lights are pointed down, illuminating the door, illuminating the entranceway, and making things safer for, for everybody. And it's a good example of that sky glow. You can see that. I see that when I'm out stargazing. I'm in Iowa County and you just say, 
Oh yeah, Dodgeville. They're playing football tonight because it's there. And there's Walmart over there. And I look over there, there's Mount Horeb and Verona and Madison. And I'm 30, 40 miles away from them, but I can see the dome of light that they put up into the up into the sky. And we get that glare, which is the light shining at us instead of putting the light where it where it belongs and not into somebody's apartment and into somebody's somebody's home. Uh, it wastes a lot of energy because we're putting light to light up the bottoms of planes and birds that really don't need that really don't need illumination. This was an example here. They're lighting up the outside of the building. There's no purpose for that. Instead, we want some lights on the on the entrance, on the entrance way. A powerful issue is this issue of safety at night. And I'm reading more and more studies about that. Ward lighting, does it make it a safer at night? It all depends on the type of lighting. I was just listening to Science Friday just last week of saying a study in Chicago. They were installing more lighting. And the effect was it made it more dangerous because the lighting was bad and it was creating shadows and it was making it more difficult for people to see in the area and people were less safe as a, as a result. So this was unintended consequence that this university decided to put up this light to make the path safer at night. Legitimate, legitimate use of, of lighting. But Spot the student. <laughs> He's there. Working over there in the shadows. Okay, so that lighting created shadows and made it less safe along that along that way walkway. Okay, and we talked before about this effect that it's having on animals and other wildlife. Yeah. Millions of years, hundreds of millions of years, they're naturally selected for a 24-hour cycle. We're disrupting that with a lot of unintended and dangerous consequences that are affecting migration, mating, food, and sleep. And these are bad, these are bad things. And I mentioned before about this effect on human health. That, has anyone ever done shift work? Yeah, okay, so I'm telling you what you already know. It's really difficult to fall, fall asleep. And a lot of the research came from what's called the nurses study of just, you know, following this group of nurses who were doing shift work and seeing how those disruptions are affecting their lives. So there's good evidence being, being put together of how this is affecting our lives. And as I mentioned, especially that blue light that's, you know, causing us to think that it's daytime when we should be having that soft golden light at night to tell us that we're going, going to bed. Okay, and of course, I care about astronomy, and when we light up the sky, yeah, we're cutting ourselves off from our home and depriving others of seeing, seeing our home. All right, back to the happy part. Easy solutions, okay? See what's happening there? This is your quiz. It's glare coming in. Here, the light's pointed down, and things are more things are more visible. We can go back and either install lights that are fully shielded, or you can buy shields to put over, to put over the lights and just to direct the light down. I know in towns and cities they've got those acorn lights, which are really beautiful, and I do kind of love them, but they're spreading light out in all directions. And I know that would be a tough conversation to have with a city or a village, but just maybe your town would be nicer if you could point the lights, if you could point the lights, lights down. Timers are really good. Dimmers are good. Motion sensors are good. And I hear people say, well, I keep the light on all night because it's safer for my home. And I would argue having a motion detector is making things even sensor. Because if a light's on all the time, I'm not noticing it. But if a light is suddenly triggered, I'm going 
to notice that. And I know some of the objections are going back a decade or more when we had that problem with squirrels and raccoons constantly triggering our motion sensors. <laughs> they've gotten better, okay? They've gotten more sophisticated and more adjustable. So if you had bad experiences back in the 70s with motion sensors, maybe it's time to give them another, give them another try because there have been some, some improvements, okay? And I know different villages and towns are experimenting with that of just, okay, Maybe 9, 10, 11 o'clock, we've got street lighting on. Maybe after that, we're going to dimmer levels because there's just not that many people out. Or motion sensors of, oh, someone's walking along here, the lights come on. No one's here, the lights, the lights go off. We've got the technology now to be solving problems like that. We can, we can do that. Okay, that's kind of information overload right there. Uh, all the different forms of bad lighting and all the forms of good lighting over there. They're available, okay, from your local and chain hardware stores. There's a group I mentioned already, International Dark Sky. They certify lighting fixtures, so look for the IDA seal of approval. There's another way of putting it, very bad, bad, better, best of just controlling the light, put the light where we want it to. Alright, some examples, this is kind of a quiz at the end of shielded and unshielded light. I like this one, two ballparks there, that one, lots of glare, that one, pointing the lights down. People are enjoying the game, but the people not enjoying the game, they're not being blinded by, by the lights. Recess lighting is really good. You've noticed that driving in the service stations at night? Mm -hmm. They are incredibly, incredibly bright. I mean, if you wanted to do surgery or something, it would <laughs> not be kind of a grungy place to do surgery. Don't do surgery at the gas station. But it is that bright that I'm wondering, I'm, I just want to pump my gas. Why do I need that level of light right here? But I guess they've done their market research that shows people are more likely to use the gas station if it's really really right. So, okay, fine. But what you can do is recess the light and I feel a lot more comfortable as a driver. I can see better coming in here because I'm not fighting against all of that nighttime, all that nighttime glare. So, good lighting, bad lighting. Uh, yeah, we want lights at the airport. I don't want airports to go, to go dark. But they've got these cutoff lights. You can see the light below here. But above, no light. And there's no reason for light to be up there. There's a lot of good reasons for light to be, to be down there. So it's that mindfulness about, about the light. And that's kind of a typical mercury vapor light that we have. And those are the ones that we are used to. And they're putting light out in too many directions. There is a real opportunity happening right now. And this is why this is more urgent to me than ever. Many villages and cities are transitioning to LED lighting because it's a lot more economical. We can save money with LED lighting. And that's a good thing. Because to go into a village and just say, ah, I'm John Maisley, I'm here to save the stars. Would you mind replacing all your lights in the village? The village isn't going to, to do that. But when the lights are already being replaced, there is that opportunity to say, hey, while we're replacing these, can we think about this, this, and this, and make choices? And I don't know, how often do villages replace their lights? Once a generation? Less yeah. than that. Yeah, less than that. So we're living with this choice and passing down this choice not to the seventh generation, but to a couple more generations. So we've got this opportunity, and it needn't cost any more money, okay? Just one solution is as inexpensive as the other, and there are still savings. So, LED, this is good because we're getting a little less glare with this solution right here. But, what I'm also hearing is that because the light is less expensive. Different cities are increasing 
the lumens, the brightness, say, oh, well, for the same amount of money, we can make it even brighter. And if we were safe with this level of lighting, we're going to be even safer with this level of lighting. So you need to watch out for that in just a second. What, what's a good level of lighting so that I can safely navigate those streets that, you know, you might not want them to be even brighter. And you notice a shift in color right there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's kind of important that we're shifting from kind of that amber color to a bluish color. We're going from warmer light to colder, colder light. And we don't need to do that with LED. LEDs come in colors. We get a choice about that. Most villages and most power companies, they might not even tell you you have a choice about that. You do. There are choices available, so we can, I hope we can do that. And this is what I learned. Lights come in colors, and they're measured in kelvins. So if you want to have a sophisticated, com sophisticated conversation with your village engineer or lighting expert on this, yeah, what kelvin are those? You want the lower kelvin ones, around 27, around 2700. If you're buying light bulbs for your home, they come in different kelvins. And so you can make a choice. Well, for my bedroom, I want a warmer light. I want more amber colors. I don't want the blue, the blue light. I mean, you think about it. As the sun's going down, the light becomes amber, golden. It's telling our red brains it's time to go to time to go to sleep. And in the morning, as the sun is rising, the sky becomes bluer and bluer, which is telling us, wake up, get in gear, there's stuff to be done. There's stuff to be done today. So that's a question you can be, you can be asking. And that's a nice summary right there. I hope on the way out, the International Dark Sky Association sat along with lots of brochures, and they use this diagram a lot, which is just really, really nice shorthand to say, I like what you need energy efficient, shield, direct down, use timers, sensors, use the warm colors, and they're also plugging and showing IDA to kind of support the support the calls. Okay, at this point I need to thank my good friend Linda Schweikert, who is a member of Iowa County Astronomers and is something of a dark sky warrior. There she is, using my slide at her presentation. No, actually, it's the other way around. Then when I found out I was giving this talk on kind of short notice, I emailed her and said, Linda, can I use your slides? And she was very, very gracious in letting me use her slides. So thank you, Linda. And she just posted recently on Facebook. She decided, yeah, if I'm going to be a dark sky warrior, I need to replace the lights at my home before somebody <laughs> outs me on that. So that was her weekend project of taking these lights out and installing these shielded lights in our home. And her hashtag is one light bulb at a time. Because it's kind of a hopeful, it's a hopeful thing of changing, of changing the world. So I'm grateful for her help. Alright. The go-to source is International Dark Sky, which is darksky.org. It is a great place if you want to educate yourself. It's good. Uh, if you're making lighting choices and you want to do it mindfully, they've done all the research for us already. So it's a relatively easy job. If you're getting ready to have one of those awkward conversations with your neighbors about, you know, that light that they've got on all night, you go there, they've got a sample script for the conversation you can have with your neighbor, different strategies you could use, or even like a note you could send to your neighbor, because, you know, we, we're good Westerners, we like to avoid conflict, but we don't want that light, you know, shining in our eyes all night. And if you're worried about working with local government, we don't need to reinvent that. They've kind of done that research of just saying, look, Here's what you need to know when you go up with your village board. Here's what you need to work know working with your local local township. Here are some of the arguments that are going to come up about safety, energy efficiency. Here's your facts. Here's your information. So it's relatively easy. We don't need to reinvent this in every community across across the United States. Okay, we're convinced darkness healthy for humans and other living things. Yep, and. 
give you the bad news about light pollution. But the good news, the hopeful solution is there are simple solutions that we can do. This, you know, on the list of the million problems facing us in America right now, this one's solvable. We can do. We can do this one. So let's turn off the timers, motion sensors, shield, point down, there's your talking points, fewer lumens, warmer light, and educate yourselves and others. And to go back to Linda's tagline, yeah, we can save the night sky one light ball back. Well, let me tell you a bit about what we're going to see. And because I promised to say how to enjoy stargazing as well. And stargazing is pretty easy. Go outside, look up, you've got two eyes, and you can. We love binoculars because they're so easy to, to use, and most people already, already own them. So if you've got binoculars, then you can stargaze. And telescopes, yeah, enjoy the sky first. I usually tell people don't rush out and buy a telescope. That it's, enjoy the sky first, try some different scopes out and find out what you, what you like. Okay, what you can see. If you're seeing that you're having a pretty wild night out there. <laughs> but you can tell I'm kind of a fan of like goes and hangs with the star sky. So this is going on right now in September and early October. It's really cool. We've got all these planets arcing across the sky. Venus and Jupiter and Saturn and Mars. And we'll see some of those tonight. They put Pluto on there because it is out there, but you're not going to see that in a telescope. I'm so dim and so far, so far away. Almost at full moon. Full moon the other, the other night, we were at 96% full moon, rising at 8.04, but we learned we need a little time for it to get above the ridges around here because triplets, yeah. And you can have fun looking for shapes on the moon. Like, has anyone seen the rabbit on the moon? That's kind of cool. And you can see the Gibson girl on the moon. Gibson girl? Yeah. What's it called? Gibson girl. Like from the early 1900s, I think of, with that hairstyle. Mm -hmm. I'm not like your big expert on 20th century fashions, but they tell me that's a Gibson, Gibson girl. Venus is still visible. Have you been noticing it in the west after sunset? Yep. And we're not going to see it because it's set about 15 minutes ago. But tomorrow night, if you're out, look for Venus in the west. If you've got binoculars, it's in a crescent phase right now, like right, right there. Let's see, what else? Mars is up. See the surface of Mars and some of the surface features. And we'll look at Jupiter and some of its moons tonight. So Europa and Ganymede are on one side, Io and Callisto way out there on the other side tonight. And we'll see the rings of Saturn, which is up, and some of its sprinkling of, of moons. We'll look at some double stars like Albireo and enjoy their colors. Point out a few constellations. Some look like what they're supposed to. Others <laughs> take a lot of imagination. Yeah. Yep. Clusters. There's a wild duck cluster. Please, I was up too early this morning and I saw Orion up in the sky before sunrise in the Pleiades. So it's it's back. And maybe we'll find the globular cluster for you. This is like hundreds of thousands of stars all bound together. All right. Lots of rules there. What could be? Light. Use the chair for balancing yourself. What else? Move your eye around. Oh, if you still don't see anything at the telescope, say something because maybe it, maybe it moved and maybe you're looking at nothing right there. So we can bring that back. Take your time, ask questions. And the game I play is in the dark. Guess the generation of the viewer by the response. <laughs> so sometimes I get cool, groovy, sweet. Dope. Yeah. <laughs> so you can amuse me by coming up with a, with a good a good response. And then finally, you know, it's all about discovering our home in the cosmos, making a pitch there. If you're on Facebook, I can kind of give you the updates. So. Thank you.